Hello, and thank you for joining us on this presentation of the guidelines on the implementation of the OPRC convention and the OPRC h &S protocol. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Peter Taylor with Petronia Consulting, Ole Christian Berkmo with the Norwegian Coastal Administration, and Clement Chazot with the International Maritime Organization. The International Convention on Oil Spill Pollution Preparedness Response and Cooperation of the OPRC Convention and the Protocol on Preparedness Response and Cooperation to Pollution by Hazardous and Noxious Substances, or the OPRC HNS Convention, encouraged the development of a coordinated response to oil and HNS marine pollution events, respectively. Both instruments call for a defined and practiced national response system with access to regional and international support mechanisms. This prepares uh, countries for a number of events, provided that they have contingency plans in place and that those plans are practiced. When implemented, these national programs can greatly improve response and mitigate the potential harm that may be caused by marine pollution events. However, there are challenges to a number of countries in putting these instruments in place. Adoption of these instruments can be daunting, and there are a number of coastal states have yet to properly develop plans or much less implement national plans for oil and HS spills. And why? It may simply be an unawareness of the benefits of acceding to these instruments. In many cases, it's going to be competition for priorities. If there are other issues such as national health care crises, pandemics, um, issues with basic infrastructure, security, and any number of other competing priorities. Of course, the lack of funds, lack of expertise, focus, and simply perceived difficulties in meeting the obligations of the instruments can be challenges to a number of countries. Recognizing that some member states have encountered challenges with the convention and protocol implementation process, IMO launched an initiative to develop a guide that promotes understanding of the overall process in acceding to these conventions. And the result is the guide that was published in 2020. The drafting process for this guide started in 2017. And it drew on the experience of uh, efforts already gained through implementing the convention and the protocol in a number of regional programs, such as the IPCA Global Initiative or the IMO Regional Seas Programs. And it also benefited from a number of national program assessments that were done using standardized tools, such as the ARPEL RATOS tool, the uh, Readiness Evaluation Tool for Oil Spills that I helped to identify at a national level where gaps and opportunities existed. Drafts and revisions of the guide benefited also from inputs received from many other organizations and associations, including oil and shipping industries. The document is designed to be easily followed and it facilitates a nine-step approach to the implementation process is organized around four key themes, legislation, development and assessment of plans and preparedness, international cooperation, and sustained preparedness. These key elements then are divided and presented in the guide as a series of steps. So one of the first steps is really to establish a sound legislative basis. Without this basis, it can be difficult to ensure whether uh, clear roles and responsibilities have been identified. If government agencies do not understand how they're going to participate and what their responsibilities are in the emergency response, then it won't provide for a coordinated response. So concepts for legislative and regulatory principles include identifying who the authorities are and their responsibilities, um, putting in place concepts such as polluter pays, um, I clearly identifying requirements for notifications and funding and reporting, and for establishing funding mechanisms and enforcement mechanisms for preparedness. 
A uh, next step is coordinating um, the response capabilities. And really this is step is, is creating a national forum or a work group to undertake the response planning and preparedness activities. Experience has shown that a lack of joined up government can be a major barrier to implementation. Therefore, the guide places importance on the creation of a national pollution preparedness and response forum or a similar body comprised of government, industry, and other stakeholders. One of the keys in this is that the individuals that form part of this forum have to have the support of their institutions and a commitment from their institutions that they can sustain and be engaged in part of developing the instruments for spill response. A fundamental and important step is the third step, and that is to define roles and responsibilities. I clearly identify the competent national authority and, if different from that competent national authority, the operational authority or lead to address spills. This step also recognizes the need to have a well-defined response management structure, one that is ideally aligned with the way in which the country handles other national emergencies with assignments for participating agencies and other stakeholders. The fourth step is to build and amplify the in-country capability so that the participants in this national forum can contribute successfully to the development of a national response plan and program. A key here may be seeking external funding sources and training to provide um, individuals in the forum with the capabilities that they need. And this can be achieved through regional programs and training uh, from outside sources. <clears throat> Importantly, people that receive the training need to remain engaged in that development process. A review and assessment of the existing national program also will help to identify gaps and priorities for the response program development. Personnel in country and or supplemented with international expertise must take an honest look into the areas that are not developed or are ambiguous within the national program. Gaps can be readily identified using internationally adopted assessment tools, such as the RPL Red Coast tool um, used at the national scope, or you can use the IMO assessment guide and other checklists that provide guidance on how to address missing elements and what they are. <clears throat> the sixth step is to develop or enhance the national contingency plan. So examples of plan content can be drawn from guidance documents, such as those offered by ARPEL, the IMO, IPICA, and also from plans with neighboring countries or regional plans. Um, one of the components of this process is to clearly identify what the risks are. So a basic risk assessment ensures that the program considers locations and products and volumes of materials handled as well as a record, hopefully, of where these uh, spill events may have ha already happened. This helps to develop the plan around the most likely and realistic worst case scenarios. Another key is that equipment, manpower, and technical expertise need to be considered in context of a tiered approach and really should be appropriate to the spill hazards and the range of environmental conditions that may be op operative in the country. Participation in regional and international preparedness initiatives provides the opportunity to assess and receive input re regarding the national program. Uh, participating agencies such as the, the competent national authority will, uh, in, in participating in these processes, along with perhaps the operational entity, will ensure that there is this exchange within the region. And regional programs such as the Regional Seas Program or the Global Initiatives are very good venues for working with this uh, within the international context. There's a real need to have procedures developed and tested for transboundary issues such as notifications or requests for assistance, the movement of personnel and expertise and equipment between regions. Offers of assistance can and should be considered as part of the global preparedness regime. It was just a perfect example of during the MV Wakashio last year in Mauritius, where resources from around the world were made available 
And this can be very, very helpful when resources in country are limited. And finally, a, a key step is to establish and maintain an effective training and exercise program. These need to be put into practice. These activities help participants come together, work together, understand their roles and expectations, and it tests the plans. Training can also consist of model OPRC courses and specialized training. And exercises really should encompass notifications. They can be tabletop exercise, equipment deployment exercises, and should also look at opportunities to engage stakeholders and neighboring states. So the guide provides these steps and links to numerous sources of supporting information. The stepwise approach in this guide is augmented with a detailed checklist uh, that steps that provides details around each of these steps and a me mechanism to track how these are developed. Um, this is also included as an annex to our paper in the conference proceedings. And the final chapter speaks to how the international compensation scheme for ship source bills enables support for preparedness and response, which of course is very important consideration for member states in terms of liability and claims. Benefits of the OPRC convention and the OPRC HNS protocol are multiple, but above all, taking these steps provides for increased in-country capabilities to deal with spill emergencies, provides a plan that can and should be exercised and practiced, and provides clear means to engage bilaterally, regionally, and internationally for effective response. It establishes a foundation for continued enhancement and improvements in preparedness to these events. The new 2020 IMO guide marks an important step forward for global preparedness and for potential oil and HS marine pollution incidents. The publication aims to encourage and support widespread awareness of the benefits of these IMO instruments. And the approach recommended in the guide should enable countries that have not yet ratified or implemented either one of these uh, instruments to achieve this important objective. And it will help foster high level political support for ratification and implementation of these instruments. Thank you for your attention and welcome any questions or comments. And feel free to reach out to myself or my co-authors uh, for further information. Thank you.